Natural gas really is the tool that can back up renewables because they have the ability to very quickly follow loads and pick up the demand when renewable supplies fall off. Generative AI is revolutionizing everything from routine work tasks to high stakes business operations. But even simple queries require significant computing power, driving demand not just for data centers, but the energy resources behind them. Enter Williams, a 117 year old midstream energy company and backbone of US power, delivering one third of the country's natural gas across some 33,000 miles of infrastructure. Under CEO Alan Armstrong, Williams has emerged as a key player in powering Gen AI and in the global energy transition. As an analyst covering midstream and renewable energy infrastructure at Morgan Stanley Research, I wanted to speak with Armstrong, one of the most influential voices in American energy, about how Williams is partnering with some of the biggest names in technology to create a new model for energy infrastructure. So I traveled to Oklahoma, and sat down with Armstrong in the Williams Lodge overlooking Tulsa's Riverfront Park for a conversation covering everything from his early career lessons to his outlook on the future of energy. Ellen, thank you so much again for having us here in Tulsa. You bet. I'm glad you're here. How do you think about the future of energy? I think we've got a very interesting challenge on our hands as it comes to energy. The good news is, is that, you know, our technologies are getting better and better. We have a lot of work going on, discovering new technology to try to deliver that. But it is going to be an all hands on deck effort to try to keep up with the demands for energy and do it at an affordable level and a reliable level. You started out at Williams. You were an engineer fresh out of college, 1986. I saw Williams as this kind of thriving, exciting place. My family had had a long connection with Phillips Petroleum Company. And so I got a lot of good advice that Williams was the kind of upstart company that was going to be growing. I was very interested in seeing big, exciting things built. And Williams had a lot going on back then. When you look back in your seat right now, any sort of lessons, formative experiences that have shaped how you run the company at this point? The first lesson I had was realizing that you can have all the answers technically, but if you don't have people coming along with you and you're not really bringing people in the same direction with you, it doesn't really do a corporation any good. I finally figured out that I really was going to have to try to attract people to help out, not not demand that people help out. You know, later in my career, some of the lessons that I've learned are developing a team chemistry is really critical to success. And that as a leader, a really important part of your job is making sure that the team chemistry is healthy and that everybody's excited to be contributing and excited about being part of a winning team. At this point in my career, I really enjoy watching young talent take on new challenges and seeing them develop and, you know, seeing them step up is one of the most rewarding things I see in my career today. When you talk to young people, campus recruit, what's the pitch for them to build a career with Williams? Keeping up with the growing demands for energy on the one hand and reducing emissions at the same time, that is a very big world challenge. And I think anybody that translates that into what they can do in their career to help that be successful is a really big deal. And so I, I do think that the, you know, the generations coming out today really do want to have a purpose just beyond a job. And I do think that this is a very big problem that we have to solve, but one that we're capable of doing if we get the right talent attracted to working on it. Alan, when you speak to investors who aren't familiar with the Williams story, what's the quick elevator pitch you give them? We are the most natural gas centric. In other words, more of our business is focused around natural gas than any other of the midstream companies. And that's not by accident. We handle a third of the nation's natural gas. The fact that the company has been around for 117 years now, 50 years of continuous dividend coming from the company and a decade of year after year after year EBITDA growth in our business. Looking forward, the environment we have right now that we're going into the macro and the demand for natural gas and infrastructure is higher than I've seen it in my career. And so I actually see a much brighter future in front of us. 
One of the things I've heard you say to investors, this is the single best commercial environment that you've been in your career. What's driving that view? First of all, it starts with a very strong demand for natural gas. We've kind of run out of options um, and we've seen demand for power generation over the last three years set a record every single uh, summer now. We continue to see that grow pretty dramatically in terms of power generation demand. Part of that is retirement of coal facilities, uh, but also now we actually are seeing pretty strong growth in electricity demand, overall electricity demand. On the surface, AI and natural gas infrastructure seem like they're not necessarily related, but maybe talk through how natural gas plays a role in potentially powering AI. If you go today to Southwest Power Pool here or PJM up in Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland area, even into Ohio, those markets will tell you get in line. If you're trying to, if you're trying to go get a large connection to the grid in Ohio right now, that that queue is eight years. Even for a modest load uh, for a data center, you're looking at four and a half to five years. I can tell you that the AI is not gonna wait on that. And so that is driving people to go and get their own direct power. And what's being referred to now as behind the meter opportunities where they will actually go and contract directly with a power generator to provide the power directly, not be connected to the grid. Now they may in the future get connected to the grid, but in terms of getting things started, the speed to market focus that AI and the, the big developers have is ver a very clear signal in the market. These data centers, they don't wanna go talk to the gas pipeline company and get their supplies arranged and go talk to the power generator, they just really don't have time. And so if you're a party that can step up and say, we can deliver that full package for you, including the gas supplies, the gas infrastructure that it takes to bring you those supplies, and including the power generation on a reliable basis, that is exactly what they're looking for. Is that the type of model that could be replicated beyond AI? Or are there other hmm. customers, uh, whether it's corporates, municipalities, that could consider something yeah. like that? The situation we have with the the independent system operators today and the queues that they're trying to manage. It's really come to light because you have governors of states that are desperately wanting to see these businesses brought to their area and they're learning firsthand that, wait, what do you mean we can't provide the power? What do you mean it's going to be four or five years? And so it's not limited to AI. If somebody wants to build a new you know, auto manufacturing facility or a battery plant or any kind of other heavy manufacturing, they're going to have to have a lot of power. And that same issue is going to develop for them. So I think until that problem is solved on the grids, I think you're going to continue to see uh, people look for these kind of behind the meter solutions. Natural gas has become more of a debate centered around uh, methane leak and potentially compromise the, the benefits you otherwise would have with natural gas. I'm curious how you would convince a skeptic that natural gas is an important part, an integral part of uh, decarbonizing or emission reducing energy economy. Well, Williams was one of the first midstream companies to join the oil and gas methane pledge 2.0, which is uh, a European based effort and we are very actively engaged with that group, making sure that the standards are tough enough and moving at a pace that the industry can deliver on. Um, but right now our target is to get to 0.0375%. Environmental opposition claims that the leakage is three to three and a half percent, you know, a hundred times more than than what we're delivering on our operations. And that's from the point of picking the gas up at the wellhead, all the way to delivering it into the city gate for the utility. So that's across our entire operations. It's not rocket science, frankly, to reduce methane emissions associated with our business. And we're taking that on as a challenge. And frankly, it's one of those things that I think our employees are excited about, that they see us really being um, forward leaning we're not changing our mind based on the administration. We think that's good long-term business, and we're gonna stay very focused on, on showing that, that natural gas is a powerful tool 
and this concern about the fugitive methane emissions is definitely something that we can deliver on. Ellen, it's always so great to get your perspective on things. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Robert. Appreciate it.